Good. Okay. So um, I'll follow the, the discussion of France and its legal culture with a discussion of Germany and its legal culture. And uh, reflecting on that assignment, it reminded me of uh, a similar um, project I undertook uh, some years ago and someone asked me to do something like this. Uh, I had an hour to explain German law and legal culture and I thought, what could be worse than trying to, to capture the essence and ethos of a legal culture in an hour and now I know. It, it's trying to do that in a half hour. So I have to trade in all kinds of superficialities and generalizations and stereotypes despite all the pain that will be doing to me. You have to understand as a, a scholar of German legal culture, I thrive and, and want to celebrate with respect to the nuances and, and I won't get to, um, to spend time on, on those kinds of things. In some sense, I could resolve this presentation really quickly um, by saying that um, everything she said applies. <laughs> it would be that easy. Uh, so uh, you should be aware that comparative lawyers and, and scholars who think about German law and German legal culture generally and quite categorically simply treat German law and legal culture as an example of maybe one of the leading examples of the civil law tradition. And we heard from Professor Curran um, what that could mean. So um, you can see here in one, one well-regarded um, well introduction to German law that uh, this is the repeated um, explanation. What you need to know about German law is that it's civilian and that means it is codified law that depends on deductive logic, that is dependent on legislation rather than judge-made decision-making. And in that sense, it is ex ante. All the rules that govern German society, as was true in any civilian system, including the French system we just heard about, all those rules are decided in advance by the legislature and built into the code. Um, so, for example, the German Civil Code has a provision that tells you what to do when your bees move from your beehive to your neighbor's beehive. And the code has resolved that. It, the neighbor gets to keep them, by the way. The, the code has resolved that even before the problem has occurred. It's abstract in that sense, and it's objective. These are the, the ways that um, German law comes to be described. Um, again, to underscore, it's... It's not, um, it's not informed by judge-made decisions as much as by the legislature and a positivist and very formalist exercise. Uh, the way I try to explain this to my students is um, to emphasize the one word that the German law students use to describe their ambitions in the law, and that is the German word losen, to solve. That is, the work of a lawyer, like the work of a mathematician, is to solve the problem in abstract in an objective sense, as though there is an, a, a correct answer to the problem. American law students, of course, don't learn to solve their cases. They learn to argue and advocate their cases, and there are always two possible or, or more possible solutions. Okay, that's, that's um, to say that much of what uh, Professor Curran said about, um, about French law applies in equal measure to, um, to German law. And I want, to, I want to just draw your attention briefly to a kind of, a kind of hero of mine. This is, this is Hermann Kantorowicz. He's a, he's a German rebel with a cause, you could say. And German rebels, um, maybe, maybe they don't ride around on motorcycles and, and smoke cigarettes and look, um, look dangerous in that respect. They write law review articles or pamphlets. And uh, he dared to write a pamphlet in 1906 as a mere PhD student or a postdoctoral student called Free Law. And I have to under, underscore this. In, um, in 1906, the Civil Code had just been enacted for six years. So he's responding in the immediate euphoria of Germany, finally having achieved its Civil Code. And he proposes something called Free Law. And I'll return a bit to what his ambitions were. But this is the opening paragraph of his pamphlet, Free Law. And in it, he tries to capture and depict the essence of the German jurist. He says, really, it's a highly trained technician that sits alone in his room. There are no windows. And before the jurist, there is a logic machine. And only the German jurist can, can master the highly complex mechanism of the logic machine. And they can feed facts to the German jurist through a slot in his door. 
and he pushes them through the logic machine and it produces an objective result. And you can see then, as he's describing this, and this is satire, brutal satire, um, you can see that he's making reference to all these core elements of the civil law tradition. It's codified, he says. You can present them with any kind of situation. It's not really that factually dependent because this has all been resolved in advance by the code. And it can even be imaginary. It doesn't even have to be a real dispute. So it's abstract. It's logical and deductively logical to um, produce the decision that has long ago already been predetermined by the legislature. All right, that's one way of capturing the essence of the civil law tradition. You should know that um, he had to publish this pamphlet anonymously because this was so, um, so incendiary. And in fact, he was discovered and he was thrown out of the University of Heidelberg for this offense, for so caricaturing the German um, civil law tradition. He could only find a new postdoctoral position in Freiburg if he vowed to give two lectures in which he demonstrated his, his commitment to and his fealty to the civil law tradition and its, um, its culture. All right, that could be one way of ending my introduction, my crash course in German civil law, is to say it's like the French and, and it has all those um, characteristics of the, of the civil law tradition. Um, instead, I want to complicate it in my 20 minutes. I want to complicate that picture just a little bit um, to suggest that it was never quite so um, monolithic as a civil law um, tradition. What I want to suggest is that, um, that comparative lawyers who seize on these broad, abstract legal families like the civil law tradition or the common law tradition, and we've heard those references today, um, they do so in an exaggerated sense. In my, my, my view, almost a, a caricature of the rich legal systems they're meant to try to portray. And in fact, in the German legal tradition, which predates the 1830s, but in the recent history of the German legal tradition, there has been quite a lot of, of discourse between this German civilian ethos that I've just described and alternative visions of way, the way the law might work. And so, for example, you have even before there is a code in Germany, there is a, a, there's a, a intense debate among scholars in the 1830s about whether Germany should have a code at all. It has a name, it's the codification strite. It's a debate over whether there should be a code or not. And one part of that debate was that it would be inappropriate to, to give Germany a code, a Roman law code especially, because that would be neglectful of German customary law, Gewohnheitsrecht. And so um, there was already some sense that maybe this civilian tradition wouldn't be a perfect fit for Germany. Nonetheless, the, the codifiers prevail. And now that Professor Kern is gone, I can say the French code is not the greatest code. All right, We can say that we all know that the German civil code of uh, 1900 is the great codification. Um, there is, in fact, a joke among German lawyers that is not at all funny. It wouldn't be funny, right, because it's a German joke. But um, there's a joke among German lawyers about the civil code, and I, I really mean it's not that funny, but it's quite revelatory. The joke goes like this. What's the difference between the Bible and the German civil code of 1900? So the, the punchline is, well, you know, we had to translate the Bible, but God gave us the civil code in the original language of God, right? Okay, so, so it's not really that funny, but it's, it reveals the reverence with which the civil code is held in Germany. Um, uh, some characterizations at the time of its entry into force uh, argued that all important legal issues in German society will be and can be and have been resolved by this, uh, this masterpiece. Um, which was also referred to as one of the outstanding cultural achievements of European history. All right, that's the, that's the posture with which the German Civil Code um, prev pre prevails in, in the German um, legal culture. But despite that, and despite the predominance of, of the codified civilian culture in Germany, you see these moments of resistance. I've already referenced one. Herman Kantorovich in 1906, the, the civil code, the ink isn't dry yet, and he's already proposing that 
maybe judges shouldn't be operating like these machines, these technocrats um, in some abstract and scientific sense. Maybe they should have some freedom to, to pursue justice in the cases that they hear. Now, I've already told you, that got him thrown out of Heidelberg, all right? So that's, that doesn't take hold. But shortly after the free law movement, which actually turned into an inspiration for American legal realism, uh, the realists thought this was a great idea, even if the German jurists didn't, there was a, another debate in Germany, again, in the shadow of this clear, codified, civilian approach to the law called the um, Interessen Jurisprudence debate in which there was uh, the suggestion that law shouldn't just be about the implementation of mere positivist, formalist, written statutory norms, but that the judges should be trying to, to divine the interests behind the positive law, and their rulings should be the pursuit of the realization of those interests, even if that might depart from the positive law. Right? That doesn't take hold either. Um, but there is this period of significant tragedy and disruption in the German um, legal narrative and history, the, the period of, of the Nazi tyranny. And at the close of that period, in 1946, we get yet another example of this, this resistance to the civil law dominance of the American, or excuse me, the German legal mentality. And this comes from Gustav Radbruch, a, a professor who had been one of the, the leading figures advocating for positivism in the, the old European civilian sense, that the written rule is all that prevails. Uh, he felt, and many felt, after um, the end of the National Socialist reign, that there could be a deep amoral element to this insistence on civilian positivism. And the, the amoral element was that it allowed people to say, well, the law was the law. It was written that I order these people onto trains. And so I was just doing my job and just abiding by the law. And no one was asking the question, is it a good idea? Is it a just thing that I'm doing? And so in 1946, Radbrook writes an article um, essentially entitled Illegal Statutes and non-statutory law. This is as revolutionary a title as you can assign to a law review article in a civilian culture that says it's about the statutes. And the title of the article is Illegal Statutes. And he, he produces a formula at the end in which he says, even if it's written law, positive civilian written law, even if it's in the code, you have to ask, if it fails to achieve justice, if it utterly fails to, to pursue the great aims of justice like equality, then the law should be ignored. It's illegal statutory law. And in fact, you should be pursuing non-statutory law that is justice. This um, comes to be one of the most cited law review articles in history in any language, the Radbrook formula. Um, what's interesting as a matter of, of history is that Radbrook and Kantorovich were classmates. And they actually prepared this free law movement pamphlet together but it got so crazy, and Radbrook was so worried about his career that he withdrew from the pamphlet. And it took him this year's and the horrors of World War II to come around to some of the, some of the jurisprudential and moral lessons that Kantorovich understood um, long before. All right. It's not then just the Radbrook formula, but we get then in 1949, finally, a German constitution that might have a chance at sticking. German constitutional history is sort of about constitutions that fail. And um, the 1949 German constitution looks to have a chance to survive. And here we have now, for the first time, a substantive legal textual document that will stand as a kind of opposition to the civil code and the civilian ethos of German law and legal culture. This allows me to say that it's my theory. I argue in some writing, but it's my theory that you can equate, to some degree, constitutionalism as a, as a phenomenon with the common law tradition. I kind of refer to it as constitutional common law. And I say that because once you have a constitution, you assume that the law will be relatively, um, relatively open textured. It won't be perfectly resolved and clearly defined 
That means that judges will be involved making deep resolutions about the meaning of the law. They're no longer technocrats operating a logic machine, but they're making decisions. And of course, constitutions are accompanied by a Bill of Rights that make all kinds of moral and justice claims and aspirations. And so now the Germans have their civil law tradition, which is predominant, but they have a constitution, and it's a constitution that looks to be promoting a kind of legal culture that is at odds with the civil law tradition. And in fact, we see then in 1958 a decision of the German Constitutional Court, the Lut Entscheidung decision, in which these two legal cultures meet and everyone understands that the constitutional common law ethos prevails. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about this decision. I have to say, this is the decision. There used to be an island you could go to, but you could only bring 10 books and 10 CDs. Nobody has a CD anymore, so I don't know if the island exists. But if there was, if there was an island where you could only bring one German constitutional court decision, this would be the decision that you would have to take. Um, it's a case that involves post-war the uh, revival of the career of the filmmaker Veit Harlan. Veit Harlan um, had been a successful pre-war filmmaker, but in the war years, it's widely understood that he compromised all of his, his moral authority and any shred of pride that a filmmaker might, might, maker might have in order to advance his career by making Nazi propaganda, including the film Jude Zeus, which was the most viewed film in the Third Reich. It's a huge success and a grotesquely anti-Semitic film. After the war, he's tried for um, crimes against humanity and acquitted. When he, when he leaves Spandau prison, his fans carry him on their shoulders out of, out of the prison. Um, and then he revives his career, and he makes the film um, Unsterbliche Geliebte um, after the war. And it's so, it's so obscene to a young civil servant named Eric Lute that he decides to issue this, um, this boycott, to call for a boycott. He has no power, but he, he goes to the streets and he says, no one should go see Veit Harlan's films. The last thing Germany needs now is for him to become a successful filmmaker again. And what does, what does Veit Harlan and his film company do? They sue under the civil code for property damages, lost revenue, on the basis of this call for a boycott. And the civil courts, applying the civil code, what, just give me the facts, I'll put it into the machine, and I'll produce a result without contemplating the morality or the justice or the political implications of the case. The civil courts uphold the civil law challenge to this summons for a boycott. Viet Harlan's film should be able to be viewed without any of this static resistance to it. The only thing left at this point to our hero, Eric Lut, is to take the decision of the civil courts based on the civil code to this young institution, the German Constitutional Court, and to say, I thought I was just exercising my right to free speech under Article 5, and now the civil courts are saying that I have to stay silent. And the big problem with this assertion is that it's not the state telling Eric Lute to be quiet. It's Veit Harlan telling Eric Lute to be quiet in a civil dispute between two private parties. And so the question presented to the German Constitutional Court in 1958 is, is there is there some mechanism that will allow us to apply the Constitution in the sphere of private affairs that has been the, the kingdom, the realm of civil law and the civilian ethos and the civil law tradition? And the court concludes that a doctrine called Drittwirkung, horizontal effect, allows the application of German constitutional principles across all society. Here we have, in some sense, the victory of the common law tradition where judges are ruling on a less than absolute or clear text like an open textured constitution and to the, to the disadvantage of the civil law tradition. In fact, the court goes on to say in this decision that we're not here even talking about actual civil rights in a constitution. We're talking about values. And those values permeate the entire society. You can imagine it's only judges then that can 
that can master and adjudicate these broad-based values. It's no longer the work of the legislatures who produce these logic machines for the, um, for the judiciary to apply. All right. That allows me to say that, in fact, Germans, German legal culture is not monolithic in the sense that it's an example of the civil law tradition. In fact, it's the meeting place between two and probably many more legal traditions, like the predominant, I've actually done a survey so I know precisely how much of German legal culture is common law influenced by way of the Constitution and how much is influenced by, I, I'm kidding, of course. You can't actually measure this, right? But it's, it's my argument that it would be in, inadequate and inaccurate to say that Germany is merely civilian. There is, in fact, a deep tradition and now a strong force for a kind of common law ethos. And I'd like to give you these two pictures to try to capture what I mean by that. This is the Bundesadler that hangs in the hearing chamber of the German Constitutional Court, the Federal Eagle. And this is the Bundesadler, if you can see through me or around me. This is the Bundesadler that hangs in the Bundestag, the federal parliament. And I think they, as images, perfectly capture the different ethos I'm trying to suggest between these two legal cultures that are in discourse with one another in Germany. The constitutional court, governed by judges pursuing justice, is made of warm, living wood, right? And you can see that its wings are, are enfolded around those who need protection, right? Do you see that image? And it's also quite ill-defined. It's a, it's a carving, and so the, the, the image is not sharp and in clear relief. The Bundesadler in the Bundestag is made of what? Steel, right? It's made of steel, and it's this highly technical, highly precise image of the law. All right, these are my claims about the two um, legal cultures that are operating in discourse um, in the context of Germany. And I will um, I'll only say then a couple of, of other things. It's possible to see this discourse between two legal cultures in Germany. And again, I'm trying to disabuse you of the notion that it's just civilian. You can see that in the structure of their judiciary. This is, this is a, a rough sketch of the German judicial infrastructure. And you can see I've circled here one horizontal pillar of German justice. These, it was hard for me to get comfortable saying this, but these the Germans refer to as the ordinary courts. You know what the ordinary courts adjudicate? The civil code. This is the home of the judges that adjudicate the civil code. These are the master technicians who have proven themselves so competent at running the logic machine that they're elevated to the highest Supreme Court, the Federal Court of Justice that sits in Karlsruhe. Across the street, on another part of town in Karlsruhe, sits the Federal Constitutional Court, which is the home of this wooden, um, living, um, constitutional presence in the German um, legal culture. I can talk a little bit more about the, the structure of the judiciary, um, but I think our, our colleague who will follow me will um, have the opportunity then, um, Felix will have the opportunity to maybe give clearer sense about where these um, infra judicial infrastructure fit into your interests as, um, as privacy advocates. I'll only make one suggestion as a way of a setup for him, which we didn't talk about, so he's not obliged to accept the, the, you know, the pitch I'm, I'm giving to you. But it's this distinction between the civilian ethos that we've heard described twice now and the constitutional common law ethos that I've posed as a kind of alternative, subaltern understanding of the law in Germany matters to us um, privacy advocates as well. And that's because they've both developed and thrown out different understandings of privacy, both with relevance in, in your work. Um, so for example, the German Constitutional Court pioneered the notion of informational, as a, as a basic right, informational self-determination. It invents this um, as a doctrine in, uh, in 1983 in the census case, but it continues to develop notions of privacy refined notions of privacy as a constitutional matter, again, by judges and not embedded in a code or a statute. For example, recently, 
the court discovers a constitutional liberty interest, a constitutional right to the confidentiality and integrity of your information technology systems. Your hardware is protected by a constitutional right and that's discovered by the justices. You don't find this in a code anywhere. And in fact, that's been extended in a decision in May that that interest no longer applies just to your hardware, but to the data you produce that is held on someone else's hardware. All right, that's one story, evolving, alive, um, aiming for justice, created by judges. It's the common law <laughs> tradition. On the other hand, you have the tradition that is the civilian tradition that depends on positivist, formalist, statutory law. And that is the famous or infamous, depending on your per perspective, um, federal data protection statute. And maybe that's the place where, um, where I can um, hand off to Felix. Thanks so much for this chance.